There it is. Hey there, Bob from Oregon's Constant Gardener. We're finally doing a viewer questions episode. It's been a while. Back. Yeah. Rested and really ready to go. Uh, not rested, but <laughs> back. Ready to do something. So we got some some email questions this time. My people may not know that that maybe you don't want them to know. People email you and you answer them. I don't know. <laughs> They'll send you an email. They'll wait for a Q&A show uh, to get their just, info. But uh, what they don't know is you could have had it three weeks ago if you just emailed me. Uh, well, also, let me ask you this while we're doing this, and we can just crop this part out if you want. But they generally send me an email, send you an email, send an email to OCG, and put it in the comments. And all those pretty much just go to you, right? Well, okay. Christopher, too, answers some good questions. Yeah, Christopher, Lisa does some. Uh, you do some. Yep. But no, those are, yeah, when I see those, and then we don't answer those on the show. Uh, yeah. Because they've been answered on the fewer thing, they've been answered in an email, <laughs> they've been answered on the OCG Fam show, and, or on OCG Fam's website. Uh, so yeah, we don't usually get handy. to those. A lot of these I'll see on there, and then we'll even mark them as, hey, we're going to answer this one, so nobody answered this. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's all changing. Cool. All right, so... So my first question, this is just a, an anonymous uh, email Er, We feel like we don't want to say their name if they're an emailer. So yeah, if they came in through my email, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't know yeah. if they want me to share their Almost. info. So. But there's certainly you can just ask questions. questions. Yeah. yeah, well, it seems like you get some interesting questions. You kind of pick through them. So uh, my first few grows, I've started counting day one of flower when the flowers start to appear. However, I asked the Nectar Facebook group last night, and the majority of people started counting day one the day they switched their lights to 12-12. What say you? No, there's a good this part. I guess if I'm going seven to fourteen days too long, that might explain the lack of smell flavor. I harvest based on trichomes, but I'll admit I struggle to see sometimes. Yeah, and that's, so, so that was an email to me, and what we start by the time you switch over. That's your flowering cycle beginning. Now, for most breeders I've talked to, that's the same concept. Is once you go from your full day cycle to your flowering cycle which with these plants 12 and 12 will trigger them into the bloom cycle uh -huh. that's your start of you know if you're it's an 82 day variety there's your start point so am i basing when in this in this system am i basing my my start day on time or what the plant looks like i mean do i just know this genetic i'm this many weeks and i boom i switch it over every time or that's up to that's grower I mean, yeah I've got guys who i have 20 week cycles 10 week veg 10 week bloom my genetics do right. that and so when i pull down 10 10 go in uh-huh um, a lot of people do two week veg, eight week flowering because that the genetic piece to all of this is flowering. Sure. So it doesn't matter. Oh, okay. Your genetics will flower in fifty two days. When you get radishes from seed to germ you know, from germination to seed to harvest, it's fifty six days for a certain type of radish. So a lot of seeds will go from start to finish, germination to death. With our plants, it's usually the flowering cycle. You can veg a plant for three years and it'll flower for eight weeks. Okay. So, but I guess when I'm doing those radishes, that is a highly finished up seed that's been worked over. Oh, yeah. Whereas with the, the, the cannabis, I'm growing on something that's, that's a little... And who knows who bred it and what yeah. chucker made it. And then at the end of it, you're it's a guesswork. But if you go too early or, or too late with your with your veg, if you don't give it enough veg time, what are the... the the problems with that it's yield yield if you don't have enough tops and branches and foliage and energy to create the flower sure. you don't get the yield so guys who have really poorly yielding genetics will uh -huh. push them longer in veg to get a better yield okay if you have amazingly you know genetics that yield amazingly you can veg them less time and get more flower off so but if i could figure out when my plant was at its apex of healthfulness and veg that would be the best time to, to flip it over but yeah. I, and I, but i'm kind of guessing on that and a little bit here a little bit there is not a a huge situation it no and like. his problem's not even the veg what he thought were they th were thinking was when they were into the bloom once they saw the first signs of female then they started counting the days and then yeah. you go 56 days from there okay but he still said that he harvests from what the plant appearances at the flower appearances and the downfall i mean he's like he's not getting the aroma and it, you know my email back to him was uh -huh. genetics 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 i mean when we put this out there to hundreds of people sure name the first five important things in a grow uh -huh. you know what what makes the best flower and number one's genetics environment fertilizer then the grower i mean we're like third on the list of what makes <laughs> yeah, quality yeah. the number thing that's quality is the guy who designed the genetics I mean, there's a guy, Thug Pug. I mean, it doesn't matter yeah. what that guy grows. It looks like somebody dipped it in crystally <laughs> snow uh, and the genetics are on point. You could do that with any synthetic base, any, I mean, it's going to show you that. 
It's whether or not it expresses with the same qualities that you like. But genetics are such a huge part of it. When I tour farms, you can see the growers that have sourced out the better genetics that are yielding better with the better terpenes and the better content because they went out and found those genetics. Then they held them, they bred, I mean, they cloned them, they keep mm -hmm. those going. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of us are just buying seeds from guys on the market. We are literally on the very first round of a genetic hunt. Out of 10 seeds, you can have 10 totally different plants that are gonna express differently. And what they may see as a finished seed is still a random, oh, is a slot machine. <laughs> male and females that they're, you know, yeah. they haven't crossed back and forth 12 years uh -huh. in a row. So you're really gonna get different expressions of that same sure. type of phenotype. So, you know, there's a lot of great breeders out there. It's talking to the breeder, finding, and then talking to growers who use breeders gear and finding out what everybody's talking about. You know, they yeah. call it the next Chad moment or whatever they say. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, don't be a Chad, just yeah. grow. So, so this is probably, it feels like it's a dumb question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. So if I had, you know, five, six, seven plants, why wouldn't I, I do some a little earlier and some a little later to harvest and, and, and see how it, it went? Is that, you know as what I mean? As far as blooming? Like yeah, I like to see if I'm well, gonna get a better flavor earlier on. Is that pos is it possibly that if he, you know, instead of waiting on some? Well, generally though, if you're doing from trichomes and you, there's yeah. a science behind clear, cloudy amber. Sure, you know, okay, You get to the sense, full yeah. amber because you waited too long trying to get more terpenes, you actually will end up, you know, potentially ruining the ultimate feeling or, sure. you know, so ideally you want to harvest to what the plant's maturity level is and then uh -huh. discard that. If you don't like it, get a new genetic. <laughs> Believe me, I'm Don't try to fix this one. Years old. I'm still chasing and I yeah. still haven't gotten, you know, uh -huh what some of these breeders have done that, you know, they have cut onlys of because they don't want people to let their genetics get out and be rampant. So, I mean, yeah. you know, pig farmer is one of our favorites and uh -huh. man, what he can do with the same genetic that five of his friends have, that's even another difference. What uh -huh. he can do and the other four guys, they all do really amazing, but sure. his is totally different. Different level thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's, I never blame the nu nutrients. It really comes down to the genetics, uh -huh. then your yeah. environment, lighting, yeah. that stuff, then the nutrition. So you're, you're finding the right genetic and not messing up. <laughs> That's your job. Yeah, so, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. So good luck with that. <laughs> okay, number two. I know that Nectar for the Gods likes to run around 400 ppm. I'm running CO2. Now I've been feeding heavier because I read CO2 demands more nutrients. I'm in week two of flower and everything is looking great. I decided to do a slurry test and found that my PPMs to be between 800 and 900 PPM. My question is with more CO2, does that need, does that need to make my minimum soil PPM higher in general? Would 400 PPM be considered deficient amount with CO2 making such a demanding environment or should I just do a plain water and let the soil PPMs go back to around 400? So he's, he's <clears> saying, does it, if you're doing well, the, the CO2, do you need more? Well, yeah, because traditionally base? when you pump CO2 into a room, it builds that plant's metabolism, right? It makes it want to consume more, wants it to grow more, sure. and produce more. Uh -huh. So usually your inputs need to increase to follow that hunger need. But then why would the PPM need to increase? Why wouldn't I be feeding more often and bring it well, down to my 150, 200 thing to... Well, the question here is, does the soil level go up with the input level? Not at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, we still want your plant to eat what we're giving them. Sure. So if you're putting in 1,600 parts per million, you're left with eight. They're not eating at all, so now your efficiency has slipped. Sure. They still look fine, and as my email back to him is like, they look fine right now. Yeah. But there may be a, a potential of lockout coming soon. So... I would be reducing those PPMs, not aggressively. I wouldn't be going from nine to 400 on right. flushing, uh -huh. but I would be doing a periodic flush to get those eight nines back down to the you know three to five hundreds. Sure. Because right now they look great. Soon they might start showing you lack of nutrition because they're gonna get too, uh, the PPMs are gonna build out. So you're certainly giving them more nutrients, but you're not trying to maintain a base level with your slurries. You want it to drop down, go up, drop down, you go up, just like you always reaction, have. But you might need more input, but that. you still want that same three to 400 in the range in your soil. If it starts building up, it's still the same result. It's like cocoa feeders that want to feed at five, seven to six, one, uh -huh. because that's what we're told. Right. The downfall of seven, five, seven, six, one, we're still not available below six. So we still encourage people, even though this is what we've been told, uh -huh. we have to do it this way to make sure our calcium is available. Well, even though we've been told to feed them higher rates of nutrition higher when rate, the yeah. CO2 is being injected, yeah. We don't want that to be across the board in the root zone because the root zone is still a fragile place that harbors bacteria, fungi, protozoa, all the living organisms. And if we start letting that number get too high, 
they start to struggle, the fungus starts to struggle, and then everything just kind of starts shutting down and you'll run into a toxicity issue. So this is not an issue of if I'm at eight or nine, I'm in the red zone going to 12, and then I have a problem. It's an issue now. It, well, can be an issue. You're going to see the results of the issue today will show in a week. Yeah. But if you make sure you're in that four to five with this excess feeding, You'll, you're not going to run into any problems, but you don't want to build up your soil PPMs to balance because of CO2. They'll eat if they want it. If they don't, it builds up, and then when it builds up too much, you start to have issues. Okay. So build up your input, keep your eye on that slurry, and then just kind of maintain that. If I'm new to doing CO2, would I maybe do anything different with my flushes? Would I maybe use some one-shot? Would I maybe do some things to, to as, a, as a net to... to to keep me in until I get it sorted out. Um, I mean, if you're new to CO2, hopefully you've already grown, so you know, what, well. you know what you're looking for and uh -huh. you know how to adjust. But usually with CO2 is, I I encourage people to, if you're injecting CO2, don't pump it in at 2200 parts per million because now you're gonna have to feed them at an alarming rate and yeah, all the issues okay. that come along with that. So start your, your CO2 lower and bring it up slowly over time. They only need to really eat aggressively for X amount of weeks Sure. Outside of that, it just makes them overproduce and that stresses plants out. Okay. So this would be no different than if I discovered I had a, a especially hungry genetic. Yeah. It would just be that kind of situation yeah. where I, like, this guy's eating up. I need to feed him more, but I don't want to have anything in the pantry there. I still want to drop down to Yeah, you want it okay. to be a healthy pantry, but yeah. you, know, you don't want to store excess because the plant isn't going to really use that when it needs food now. Because when it gets built up, then you need the microbial field to break all that stuff down. And if you're force feeding at that rate to keep them healthy on the inputs, the microbes aren't living and thriving because they're being fed so much that they can't keep up with the feed. So in his specific situation where he's getting to this eight or nine, should he just slowly back off or should he do something with the I just told him right off the bat, it's like go back into just a Gaia Herc feeding. Okay. You know, aggressive feeding in the realm of like one tablespoon of both. Mm -hmm maybe two of Gaia, keeps them fed, but we're gonna start breaking down that eight to 900, get them into that four to 500 again, then go back to your regular feedings. But I think he was, everything looks fine and that's great, but I think uh -huh. he's starting to get to an echelon point. If he bumped it one yeah. more without taking care of the eight to nine in the soil, then we're gonna to start to see more of a buildup lockout issue. But you wouldn't do a flush or a microbial thing more so than you're doing just normally with your- I would, If anything, I'd do a flush. flush. But I, he wanted to go right back down to four from nine, yeah. and it's like, you don't need to do a stripping flush. Yeah, let's eat this. Just start doing the slow flushes to get them down, but okay. not increase it. Outstanding, okay. Uh, three, I noticed that bloom chaos is listed above the pH adjustment process and the, on the feed chart, but the OCG fam YouTube channel, the Kahuna Beard, <laughs> clearly states that chaos is the best added after pHing to avoid some binding uh, premature reaction in the reservoir and not the soil. And I'm for sure I was reading this. I was wanting to ask you about this myself. Mm -hmm. Wondering if the feed chart should be adjusted to reflect that. I'd be willing to bet that most people add chaos prior to Olympus just because of the feed chart order or am I misunderstanding something? Thanks and keep up the great work. I was So when I read the chart myself, I thought, felt like the pH thing at the bottom was an addendum to it of where here's what you do your, your pH at and then you would still do it in order. But I, when, I, when I hear him say this, this makes sense to me too. It does. What did you think when you read this? Well, and, and it's a guy who watches our show. So yeah. he's getting special information from people who've dedicated their time to watch our show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what I wrote back to him was pretty simple of when we put out that feeding chart, uh -huh. we... we Put it out in the in the order of which we would encourage people to mix that. Sure. Uh -huh. And it's not science. It's just a pH issue. It's a reactivity issue. And what it boiled down to for us was that, what boiled down for me is simplicity. I mean, yeah. there's nothing simple about the Roman feeding schedule. Yeah. But if I'm going all these products, then a pH adjuster, and then this chaos that I can't explain to people. Yeah. Uh -huh. Then that doesn't make sense. And no. now it's a whole nother form of question. Sure. So when you mix them all up and chaos is the end and then Olympus up, yeah. there's, there's a reaction that's occurring that we've discussed the reaction sure. with calcium, we, you uh -huh. know, what it's doing. Okay. And we're trying, to, um, we're trying to get that reaction to get, happen yeah. in the root zone. The downfall is if you start changing it up on the feeding schedule, then people aren't gonna understand that whole concept. Exactly. And if we have it all down and then the pH adjustment, because any other nutrient line in the world you mix up your nutrients, you stir, you check and adjust the pH. Mm -hmm. Or if you have a dosatron, they're dosing, 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 it goes into a cistern, 
It gets checked. It gets starts with pH. There's not yeah. a next thing. Right. The pH is your last stop. That's it. Yeah. So for the most of our customers, they're never going to see any ill will from that. They're going to see nothing but benefits. The reaction is long enough that it's going to still react sure. to the root zone. So you're going to still see a benefit no matter how you mix it in. But because you watch the show, you get these special little yeah. tips and tricks yeah. that aren't anywhere else because we're talking to you. So what you're doing is doing all the mixing, you do the pH, and then you add that in. That way your reaction is right before you feed. Uh -huh. uh, As you opposed know. to the other way of like, you know, it's, I think, you know, you're like, so when you first start it, you, before you got a feel for everything, you're burp, burp, oh yeah, burp. Taking forever but when you get to it, you're like, blah, blah, blah. That's about right. Boom, go. Yeah. It's not a big deal. But it's, 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 a, it's a trick. Not that's a, the difference between one per light or 1.11224 per light. I mean, it's really yeah. these little tiny layers uh -huh. that is what 12 years of running this nutrient line will do. It just gives you these little nuances, but it's nothing you can publish. Yeah. It's nothing you can teach on a schedule. It's only guys who are paying attention yeah. that ask good questions because that's a great question that makes sense. Yeah. But you know the slightly better way of doing it than the masses. I, you know, we tried to do a series on the show where it was Advanced Nectar, oh, but I think just the whole show was Advanced Nectar. You know, you get little sad. tips and tricks where it, it, you can't really put it all into one big thing. You just, as you go along with it, you get you get spoon-fed instead of getting, you know, a hose put well, down your throat. I mean, we've been uh, using this line for 12 years, 13 yeah. years, 14 years, and still every round learning something totally yeah. new that we can go, oh! Yeah. We shouldn't have done that for 12 years the way we have, but we did. And, you know, we're moving on to this next step. But a lot of people are taking this and owning it. Yeah. All right. So now we're into the actual questions. Well, not the actual questions, but the questions from the, the comments is what oh, I should okay. say. Yeah, I say. Yeah, not the actual questions. Those were good questions. Those are great questions. Great those questions. are questions just from this morning. Yeah. That's well, I, I see all your the emails from that the thing that come in there. And I'm like, oh, that's a good one. That's a good yeah. one. That's a good one. Yeah. Okay. So John Doe. Hey, John, what's going on? Stanley looks great. I saw him. He looks pretty good, doesn't he? How old is he, do you think? Did you have Stanley when you were there, or is that that's a Christopher thing, I think? He's been a, was he a ficus? It's a ficus. Yep. Yeah, it's amazing how much for, for moving around as much. Usually <laughs> a ficus, you move it and loses its leaves. I, I take it up and down the stairs, and then I go put it back. He's, he's yeah, fine. They don't like that. Yeah. So. He seems, he's There's a tough guy. For you. <laughs> uh, I can't believe I used to freak out when my girls would eat down to 150 ppm the day after feeding. Get them hungry, feed vigorous, repeat cost dollars in newts, but it's worth it. Also, with that being said, how much hurt can a plant take? Like if it has had alien finger arthritis and some mild rust and on the top leaves, I'm usually running four teaspoon, tablespoons of hurt per gallon. Worried I'm giving it too much. So he's seeing some signs that he's giving it. Are those, would you say those are signs he's giving it too much or are those no, signs of something? That, you got some root health going on or something mm -hmm. going on in the soil. So slurry numbers would be really ideal there. Find out what's going yeah. on in that. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, again, if, you, if you're if you using chaos, you can use um, way more than four. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, my my max has been four ounces per gallon at eight tablespoons, uh -huh. and I still feel like I could have fed them more. I just didn't see the benefit. I have had guys that literally outdoors running insane levels at one quart per gallon. 25% of their mix is concentrated liquid bone meal. So it comes down to genetics, environment, container size, um, of plant health, plant strength, plant size, plant, you know, it's there's so many variables to that question. But two to four tablespoons is pretty standard, pretty normal. Six is a heavy feeding in my world. Mm -hmm. Eight is pushing it beyond what you should. So would you say that the ultimate diagnostic tool is a healthy looking plant and that when we do ppms and ph and things like that we're looking to figure out what we did wrong or what's going on if we see an unhealthy plant mm -hmm. or that, yeah I any mean, sign of any stress yeah, the uh -huh. root zone is going to tell us because if it's not yeah. coming in from the roots that's why it's something went on so what's that i mean right now i have a guy that has a plant he sent me pictures and everything looks really healthy but he's just now starting to see what would to me appear to be a really slight potassium deficiency uh -huh, uh -huh. And the slurries look good, except for they're six six to six point eight, and a lot of some of these genetics are, you know, they're very hungry for potassium, or some genetics are really hungry for magnesium, or mm -hmm. so. What I'm, what we're going to try with this gentleman is reducing his soil pH because at six six, eighty six point six and six S's suck. Yeah, six says <laughs> X's X's are no good. Anyway. <laughs> 
With those higher pHs, that yeah. potassium is not nearly available. And even with the cal calcium reaction and uptake, that potassium is really ideal at that 5, 7 to 6, 2 mark. And if he's uh, running a 6, 6, 6, 8 every single feeding, I think what we're running into is a pH drift up and the potassium is being shut uh, down. Okay. So just doing a couple of 6, 1, 6, 2 feedings with Gaia can reset all that and then we'll see where we get with potassium. And that's the same situation. Is once you start to see it, it's usually something that happened a while ago. Uh -huh. And now we have to react yeah. to what's going on. Uh -huh. And then how do we fix it? You know, there's no overnight fix. It should take three to five days. Sure. But he should start seeing a noticeable difference on new growth. The older growth will stop stealing because with potassium, it can, it's, you know, it's, a, uh, it's a mobile nutrient. Yeah. So it can be translocated from the plant. It oh, it'll, from it'll itself suck it up from the bottom. So it's always trying to keep the new stuff, the healthier. younger generation healthier. Yeah. Okay. So that, that, I had a, I know, this may be a dumb question too. If I was really, really leaning into the Herc, I'm really pushing hard, would I change or narrow the band of the pH I'm working with to be a little higher, a little lower to compensate for how much of the herc I'm putting in? Or is it is it just, or are we in a good range with the 6, 3, 6, 8, somewhere in there, no matter Usually what we're doing with dependent, it? dependent, yeah, I would say, uh -huh. oh, as far as in the... Yeah, in the if I was just going crazy with herc, I'm doing seven tablespoons. Well, the one thing I keep in mind there is that herc is pretty low pH. Yeah. So if I start pushing it and I got this Olympus up that is reacting to it, well, when the reaction's done, that pH can start to drift again. So yes. Yeah. I do kind of watch the sl soil slurry that after, you know, a week of feeding them heavier and heavier, uh -huh. I'll check that slurry to make sure I'm not getting lower and lower because of the Herculean slow-releasing acids yes. in, the, in the soil. Oh, okay. So it's just being mindful of, at that point, while they're taking it, I'm feeding them 2,200 parts per million. Uh -huh. It's left at 400, and the pH when I started all this was 6.4, but now it's 6.2. Yeah, I'm going to start feeding them at a higher pH to make sure I don't keep drifting. But I don't want to push outside that range of like 7 or no, something. No, not like so, the soil is like totally ruined at a 5.5. Five. But we did a, a, a video about the pH up. It would be a good one to look at if you have real issues where you got to go way up or way down. It's a little different strategy, but they can look at those to, yeah. to do that. And there's yeah. so many. At very, I know we were yeah. supposed to do a show on that, too. I know you did do a show on that, but there's, you well, know, there's yeah. other methods you can get those things up and down. Um, that don't really require flushing or feedings. It's more of like, go on, get a dry amendment or yeah. fungus and make these. Well, that's what I, why I did those episodes is I wanted to get it out there and get a little bit of a feedback on it and then make a dedicated episode about up and down. Yeah. You know, pro, pro track. On the YouTube, YouTube. And they look like this or this. <laughs> okay. So I, I think we got that. So Seth Gross says, hey, Bob. Transplanting a plant from one gallon to ten gallon smart pot in nectar number four soil. The plants are a bit larger. They were in a smaller pot longer than they should have been. Using the sample line, should it, which is like the Greek basically, um, should I be feeding half strength? So he's, I guess they're probably root bound, and is that what he's saying? And then he's he's going. And, it sounds like he was. I need clarifications. I, why would you go to half? Is, are, did you move, did you plant well, into a super soil? I get here's what I've done before is I've done it with seedlings too. Like I, I just kept putting off, putting off, putting off, and I got a plant that I know it's going to make it, but he's not happy <laughs> because of the pot he's been yeah. in. I'm moving into a bigger pot, into a big bunch of soil, and so I know this. Guy, is there something I can do to kind of to get him over the hump? Like you know, I did it with some flowers where I left them, left them, left them, left them, and then when I put them into the big pot, most of them were already just hammered by this point. Yeah. But a lot of them made it, and I had a great, I had a great run. Well, the hard part yeah. there is that if you've gone to the point where you're so ripped on there's no more soil, then they're starving because there's yeah. no more soil. Yeah. And you've been hydroponically feeding them. So going into another medium, and if as long as it's like a gentle number four, number soilless number two, or something that's not got a full charge, uh -huh. they're still starving. Sure. So, I mean, I never feed heavy when I transplant because I don't know how they're going to react to the new soil, what the roots are doing. So I usually will just do Gaia feedings until they take. Okay. And then once yeah. they take, then I go back to regular feedings. Yeah. Um, well, you may have just done kinda, fucked up. <laughs> and here, well, you know, now I have another customer who, yeah. I, again, it was a busy week of emails yeah. from being gone. But, you know, he... he got done with his crop, pulled it out, and then the top half was all roots, and the bottom half was completely empty soil. And he's like, man, what happened? And I'm like, well, 
when you transplant a fully rooted plant, yeah, and the roots are spiraling at the bottom, and they're you know it's a root bound plant, and you yeah. just take that out and put it into fresh it soil. It's not going to the fresh soil. Yeah, it's going. It's internally now. It doesn't right. want to leave. So when you're done, uh, you can rip it it's out. It's like those creepy fingernails. They turn yeah, back they on turn themselves. Back. Yeah, well, that's what the roots are doing. Yeah. So if you're you, when you go to transplant, you have to agitate the roots. You have uh -huh. to get some loose tips moving outward. Uh -huh. And then plant in it so the roots want to kind of head down and out, and then they'll take into this new soil. A lot of people are just transplanting root balls into new fresh dirt and then blaming the soil for not allowing the roots uh -huh. to grow through it, but they never will. They're, they're locked in a cage. Do you ever um, slice them? If yeah. I have big pots, yes. If yeah. I'm in a little six gallon, I'm really careful because yeah. if you go too deep, you could literally suffer so many that they won't taste. So you just kind of give it a little... I massage them. Yeah. I, I take those ringlets, I rip them right uh, the heck okay. off, so I got uh -huh. ten little fingerlings going I on, got you. and then transplant that way. Okay, okay. But half as far strength, as speaking, I mean, it never hurts to start half strength. Have a foliar bottle on the side to keep them happy and foliar uh -huh. feeding, and then increase it back to your regular strength. So, but when you're in sketchy situations like this, you kind of go back to more of a, of a Gaia situation. I go simplistic. Just Gaia yeah. and Gaia Herc. Yeah. You know, just something that's giving them calcium and just the base nutrition without trying to overfeed. And then what would you foliar feed to, to spoon, to IV them kind of? If it's, a, I mean, pretty much, you know, kelp, Poseidon, uh -huh. humic, Zeus, uh -huh. um, Athena's, Aminas, so amino acids. Like a little bit just of three, yeah, kind of, one, one, one teaspoon yeah. of everything and just, because you're just trying to keep the plant eating Something. not eating itself yeah I you know, deliver the food yourself and give it all things that are mobile and nothing that's immobile so it can at least stay kind of in a stasis until it gets its shit together yeah. down the roots and it will help encourage it because you're keeping it healthy here so that'll send that health yeah message down. Okay. go find new health okay. so it's just working both angles to speed up the transition okay okay jay king hey bob i see you have some white stains on the bottom of stanley's pot I'm using fabric pots with nectar number four soil, nectar line, and cultured biologics. The whole outside of my pot is covered in white fuzz. Is this normal? Could it be from any products like cultured? So Stanley's just, she's been in that pot for a say, thousand years. Who knows what that is? That yeah. could be fossilized to death. <laughs> that could have been the other three trees that were in there before. No, but, but he's saying fuzz. No, he's so, got fungal. And that's between, you know, the mycorrhiza that we source out and the bacteria hyphae that are created from cultured, the bacteria uh -huh. hyphae that's created in the humus that we use from the river bend. I mean, there's, uh -huh. it's life. That is the byproduct of life. So, yeah. yeah, that's great. Don't hit a fungicide on there. Just let it be. <laughs> that's a fungus. Okay. And it's a beneficial one. As long as your plants look healthy and nothing's rotting out, you've got beneficial fungi that's living on the outside of that. Or just bacterial hyphae, which is still very beneficial. Okay. I don't see the name on this one, but I wanted to ask you this too, because I get this a lot. People, they're like, well, I just test the runoff. They, do, they don't do a slurry test. They test the runoff. And it sounds like some people do that mm -hmm. and have good, good luck with that. But... That's really not the optimal way to your way of thinking, right? Well, it's not, you did a whole episode on consistency. Yeah. So runoff is nothing that we looked by because that's the things that nothing wanted, your plant didn't want. Yeah. yeah. And so when it keeps being pushed down, the plants don't want to access that, so it keeps going down until it's gone. Uh -huh. And where all the plants are, our plants are feeding are in that top strata of that container. Uh -huh. So if we are always getting the same information from the same area, this can be 200 parts per million, pH is 6.4, and the plants can be looking like a little bit yellow because they're hungry. Down here, it can be 1,200 parts per million with a pH of 5.1. Yeah. Well, if that was any of those, that thing would be fried up, cooked, brown, and dead. And Done. So yeah. we're going to go with what the plant can access versus what the plant sure. is rejecting. Uh -huh. Now, the runoff test, a lot of people use that as their final flush to find uh -huh. out they got everything out of their soil. Because uh -huh. if you run it all through and it keeps getting pushed down and you keep pushing it down until it's gone, uh -huh. then people know that I have nothing left in the soil that's reactive, nothing, no cations that are firing off, no absorption rate. Now it's a good time to harvest their soil. So runoff for harvesting uh -huh. is probably way more of a useful tool than trying to diagnose uh -huh. mid-veg what's going on. But runoff's a common strategy in, um, what, hydroponics or something? I mean, it's, well, synthetics. It's synthetics, and, yeah. Well, I, it's a common practice since the beginning of gardening. I mean, that's what we've done for years uh -huh. until I met Frank uh -huh. 25 oh. years so ago. So like, now you do it where they eat. You don't do it where they uh -huh. shit. So even with synthetics, runoff may not be the best way to 
Well, and the difference with synthetics there is that it's soluble, so it runs by it regardless. Whoa. So you'll always have lower numbers on the top yeah. and higher numbers down low because that's how the salt's being pushed down. But if sense. it's being pushed down below the absorbing rate of your fungal, your bacterial bodies, uh -huh. and all your root hairs, the plant's not accessing it anyway, so it's literally just wash out. Now, if you really want to damage your plant, water them from the base up. So you take that 1,200 parts per million that's in your root zone and you keep forcing them up, forcing them up. Uh -huh. Well, now that 200 is now 1,200 because you pushed it up from the bottom and then it doesn't want to go away after that. Is that a situation too when you have bad drainage? Where, you know, it's kind of well, hanging out down there, it kind of siphons, it, see, it sucks it back up as it dries on the top kind of thing or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. Well, it just cycle. It's not yeah. a good way to do it. No. So well, let me ask you while we're on that. So we had a question, we made a whole episode about it, about where to take the slurry test you know, a couple inches down as opposed to six inches down or 12 inches down or mm -hmm. from the bottom of the pot. Do you think when you're getting it from near the top an inch or two, I mean, that may not be the actual accurate number, but it's a good analog for what the number is to see a, 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 a trend yeah. to it. Well, I mean, doing this for 14 years and, you know, diagnosing people's issues, I'd say with a 92% uh -huh. accuracy, we're pretty much on the bar of if it's reacting in that top four to six inches, uh -huh. I mean, I like two to three to four inch. Uh -huh. yeah. If it's reacting there, I know what I'm gonna see when you send me a picture. Because uh -huh. looking at these numbers, I know what, what I, I, not, I know what to expect. Yeah. If you're taking it from nine inches down, I don't. That's that's something that's been pushed down for three feedings. I don't yeah, know what that. Know. What's yeah. even eating there? If we'd always been doing that, we might be fine with that. Well, but we've always been doing this at that point. Yeah. yeah. And like yeah. you said, there's no actual. I mean, if you call Blue Lab, they'll say two to one or four to one. Yeah. You call it shit. When we make potting soils, we literally Q and A every single one four times. One batch, every yeah. single yard gets a Q and A, and we have mm -hmm. to average it. And we do it with four pens because every fucking pen we yeah. use yeah. is completely different on uh -huh. numbers. So if I use only this one, it's not going to be the same reference. I mean. Don't do this because you'll hate life. I mean, this will <laughs> yeah. literally put you in a moment where your brain will pop and then you go out and buy three pH meters uh -huh. and try to adjust your first nutrient feed and then try not to pull your hair out because you're going to be 6'2", 6'3", 6'4". Well, guess what? They're all going to be at 1'6", 2", 1'6", 3", 1'6", 4". Now you don't know which one's right. Yeah. And we've taken our soil labs where we've done four QAs with ours, sent uh -huh. it off to an analytical, I mean, an actual... A&L Laboratories or Kuo Laboratories uh -huh. and they bring, come back with, well, your pH is this. And you're like, under what method? Because uh -huh. that doesn't reflect all three of ours that we've done. Uh -huh. Oh, how do you do it? We tell them how they do it. Oh, well, when we do it that way. Oh, you're right okay. in. Yeah. So when there's no right or wrong way. If you want Blue Lab's advice, do it Blue Lab's way uh -huh. and they'll tell you how to do it. If you want Nectar's advice, do it Nectar's way and we'll uh -huh. tell you what is going on from what we've done for 14 years of understanding. So, and that's less about scientific method and more about the community has got a standard that works for all of it's us a, so that we can talk about it's it. It's a little of both because scientifically for yeah. us with our knowledge and uh -huh. our nutrition and how it works, uh -huh. it's scientifically we can fix your problems. Yeah. If you yeah. want to be scientific but we can't yeah. teach it because most uh -huh. people don't grasp it, it's bricks meters. Yeah. You go out there with nitrogen, you foliar feed nitrogen, you let it dry, you squeeze it and you find out how much it increase or decrease or stay the same. Uh -huh. And if you're things are all over the board, you can then start breaking down what the plant wants or doesn't want. But to the latter. <laughs> now you have to go out and buy, you know, thirty two elements, specific <laughs> elements uh -huh. that you're putting just magnesium on the plant, manganese on the plant, boron on the plant, nitrogen on the plant. And you have to foliar feed branches so you can get how that plant is responding to that uh -huh. reaction. So I like we get they we got one of those blue lab probe things and I'm sure it's a good device, but it was not consistent with what we've been doing and I mean at some point maybe that's the thing I, I guess what I'm getting at is that this is developed over time right I mean it was 10 years ago it was a slightly different method than it is now kind of thing and it just well no I, I mean before I got into this industry with nectar I've never even heard of a slurry test really and now it's like the most so, common thing out there and it's uh -huh. funny because I really don't think that that was I mean I'm not going to say we created it but uh -huh. I'm pretty sure Frank came to one of my grows uh -huh. 20 years ago and went have you done a slurry test and nobody I've I mean the, hell is the that? owners of down to earth didn't know my uh -huh. co-workers are down to earth my coworkers at everybody's garden center, nobody knew. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden we're all slurry testing it and all of a sudden things started making sense. And now a lot of people are like, well, I, that slurry test, that takes so long. It does, but you know what? You don't have to do it every time you feed. That's ridiculous. Yeah. I yeah. mean, if your plants are looking weird, start slurry testing, you're gonna find out why. If they yeah. look perfectly fine, 
slurry test the week before you go into bloom. Uh -huh. Find out what you're looking like before you go into bloom. For a baseline. Baseline your bloom. Uh -huh. Maybe third week in the bloom, right before you get to really heavy feeding. You want to find out where your baseline is right before you go. And if uh -huh. everything looks good, if everything looks good, push them. I like to do it about two weeks before harvest. Find out how bad do I need to start my flush. Uh -huh. And then I like to do it at the very end just to see where, you're at. where am I at. Because if the flavor is harsh, something happened and my, my soil slurry came in at, you know, 6'4 with 1,200 parts a million, eh, it might be harsh. I can, yeah. And so you can, yeah. I do four. Uh -huh. Now, if something like tips start burning, I get the claw, uh -huh. something twists, a whole branch dies off, oh, I mean, it's slurry. Going on. And then for fun, I'll take one every round and be like, all right, I'm at 20, 200 parts per million in, and my slurry's at 200 parts per million the next day. They love this feed. It's I used working. to slurry test all the time. It was just like, okay, well, I've gained the common sense knowledge to look at the plants and go, See, he needs this, she needs this, she needs this, she needs that. Yeah, it's just like anything where you, I talked to a guy that, that buffs cars a lot and he said, I used to look at it, but now I feel it. It's just like when I'm, when I'm doing it over the paint, he says, I can feel when it's smooth. It's oh, better than I can look at it. Through the machine. Yeah, 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 through a machine that's vibrating all yeah, over the place. It either feels like you're dragging across some yeah. sticky glue or yeah. glass. Uh-huh. It's just you get <laughs> a feel for something over time. Yeah, that's interesting. And most people, if you love the plants, you'll get the feel for it. It seems like that that makes a difference too. If you really care about what you're doing, you're into it. That even if you don't know what the heck you're doing, you seem like you do pretty There's well. No question. Yeah, uh, and especially with this plant, I think half of it is luck. Yeah. Yeah. Twenty five percent of it is passion, and twenty five percent of it is you got lucky and somebody gave you good genetics to uh, start. Well, and I think that you can mess up because you when it goes bad, you try to put meaning to why it went bad, and it may have just gone bad because it just went bad, the seed There's or whatever, so or who knows, variables. or someone snuck in there. Oh, and, we'll just blame the fertilizer. <laughs> there you go. Or the soil. <laughs> the soil did it because it the soil. I've never failed in all of my life. And it's like, as I get those emails all the time, I'm so disappointed. It's like, so this is your second round and you're already disappointed? You know how many plants I've killed? You sound like a real in individual. <laughs> well, you sound like a third place trophy winner. Ah, it's like, oh, uh, he's just so good at, what was it? What was third place? It was blue, right? Was it white? Bomb, bronze. Well, no, like when you get when you get the ribbons in yeah, school for running. White. You got to think it was maybe white. Well, it was either blue, red, and the off color that was free from Whatever the was ribbon free, store. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be the free ribbon color guy. Well, you know, they say the third place guy is the happiest guy, though, because the silver guy is, like, pissed he didn't get gold. And the gold guy is like, oh, what am I going to do now? So the the, the, sil the bronze guy is the guy that's happiest at the Olympics. And that's where it all began, <laughs> right there. Forcing that He's like, I made on. it! No, you know what? As, as Ricky Bobby's dad said... <laughs> <laughs> You're the first loser. You're the first one to lose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't win, you've lost. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Andrew Hicks. Bob, what are your thoughts on what day to feed water? I usually feed when I get home from work. And with the light schedule, the lights stay on two to three hours after I feed. It doesn't matter when you feed if you're indoors, right? It matters with the lights. I mean, there's a... Well, humidity and things like that it's change over time, variable. right? Yeah, yeah okay. if you're not having problems, but I mean, plants generally store energy, gather energy from light and nutrition during the day, and they grow at night. Yeah. So ideally, just sometime during the light cycle, you know, I foliar feed in the morning, so I have the whole day to dry up, and then they accept most through the stomata in the morning because uh -huh. they're most wide open. Feeding, I just try to avoid the last hour of the night because now I'm putting a ton of moisture into the room that's about to go dark, and then I get this relative uh, humidity convergence that uh -huh. takes you know if you start messing with your vapor pressure and all uh -huh. your variables of watching i mean if you can keep your relative humidity in check with your temperature so they're shifting uh -huh. like this your temp goes down your humidity goes down at the same plane but most people temp drops humidity climbs mildew starts or mold so this is how you get vapor in your room or moisture uh -huh. in your sure. room is when you get your your humidity to jump over your temp so if your tent goes down, you want humidity to go with it. If they go up, you kind of want to balance them. Relative humidity is very important. Well, so I guess in theory, you could control your environment to where you could do it however you wanted, but why would you fight the day and nighttime cycle of the but earth feeding it. when you can, you know, yeah. when you could just play along with it? So playing along with it, you'd, you'd, you'd uh, do your foliar, and in the morning, then, would you do, if you, would you use your light cycle in your tent the same as the light cycle of the, of what's going on outside of it? Would you do lights during the day or do you do lights at night? Or I mean, Well, I can't because in the winter, 
it's too cold to run daytime. I won't run oh, either. Oh, the so. temperature is what yeah. you're doing. So, so you're doing at night to get the. And same in, in the summer for a lot of guys that run high wattage stuff is uh -huh. that you got your coolest air coming in at night. So uh -huh. if I can run my hottest part of the day at night sure. and my coolest part of the day in the daytime. So reversing it makes sense. It helps a lot. You okay. know, a lot of guys in the winter, you know, they've got such a way better environmentally controlled room uh -huh. so they uh -huh. can run it whenever. Yeah. You know, it is literally its own environment. I'm in a garage, so yeah. I kind of go uh -huh. with what the flow is. I've had plants freeze. I've had a 50 gallon drum freeze in half with water and looked out there. I'm like, yeah, plants don't like 22 no, degrees no. no matter what. I didn't get a frost, but I got that. So, do you run hotter lights? I mean, you, you no, run less no, efficient lights to heat? No, that yeah. was the problem because I'm so much in love with what the LECs do. Oh, the quality of the light. But why am I going to spend a bunch of energy for just for the heat? Yeah. And I don't like, I mean, I don't, it's not that. I've played with them all, and I really uh, like what the LACs have been doing to my plants yeah. as far as quality terpenes and medical. Uh -huh. So I don't switch. I just stop growing. There's still many <laughs> damn good growers out there. I don't have to grow. I just grow for fun now. Nice. <laughs> I've got the better guys I get it from. John Simmons. Saponaceous. Saponaceous. Equals soapy. Soap. We talked about this. Didn't you say that word at some point? Saponin. Saponin. You saponaceous. So... Question, I like would this be more. similar to using 2% solution of Dawn as an insecticide? He's talking about, I think he's talking about Hygieia, isn't he? But See, yeah, well, don't use Dawn because it's detergent. Detergents kill bacteria and fungus, and that's all what we're trying to promote. Well, they also dissolve oils, don't they? Which well, was, soap yeah, I mean, well. that's so that's... Is that that's what, what saponins do, is they just break down soap. Honestly... Uh -huh. I don't use Hygieia as a pesticide or a soap yeah. breakdown. I use it as a sticker for things that I want to hold want to the thing. Uh -huh. I don't really use it as a foliar feed. I use it as a fungal feed in the soil or a rehydration of when soil gets too dry. dry yeah, yeah, if okay. you have a dry spot, Hygieia will help get the dry pocket and make it go away. For soaps, yes, same concept and actually a soap is far more efficient, uh -huh. far cheaper. Yeah. But get, you know, order some Dr. Brauner's, something that is not a detergent. Detergents yeah. are deadly. Yeah. Not, I mean, they're deadly to microbes. Yeah. Where Dr. Brauner's is a fatty acid in a protein, so it's actually feeding a microbial. Anything residually left over will actually become food for bacteria. So, so it won't harm anything at that same 2%. So, are there any nectar nutrients that you use the wetting agent with under any circumstances? Well, a lot of people do. I personally don't because uh -huh. I want the absorption rate. I'm not trying to have it hold up. Yeah, now, most you want to get it in there. Yeah, and a lot of people use it because or use a fatty or saponins or fatty acids because they're using, you know, essential oils from plants. They're using these pesticidal oils and they have to emulsify into the water. And to do that, you need saponins to break down the, uh, okay. the oil. So, like a mercenary from um, yeah, cultures mercenary. It's kind of worked out to where it kind of works on its own. But if you're trying to yeah. do that with some essential oils that are just raw oils, and you or want to get those in the water, to hold up longer, then you put that on there, and it keeps it on the surface longer. So that way, if there's moisture in the air, there's humidity, there's uh -huh. you know your foliar water, foliar feeding, it keeps a layer of that essential oil on the plant so that the bugs still have to eat through it. So, but what we're doing with the nectar stuff is feeding, and we want it to soak in. Yeah, we're doing it as more of a fungal feed, and, and a lot of guys use it as a pest control as far as not, it's not a pest control, has no pest no, control, yeah. but it helps carry oils mm -hmm. from pest control products onto plants. So it's all the bugs that are wading through a swamp instead yeah. of walking over a... But he's better off for the soaps to yeah. go something way more natural. Sure. Get, the yeah. Dr. Bronner line, you can order it online. I prefer the peppermint because of the mint oil uh -huh. it messes with bugs. Uh -huh. um, but it, And it's one that you can wash your dishes, your hair, your butt, your dog, your cat. It doesn't matter. You can wash everything with Dr. DeBronner's safely. Okay. And it can go into your water stream into the ocean and it won't create a problem. Yeah. Because we have a lot of detergent issues in our country. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I'd, I'd say we have more problems with detergents than we have with plastics. Oh, yeah. No. What we discard. Well, you just, I mean, you, 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 you take some of that, like if you spill a little of that soap on a carpet and you start spraying a hose on it, you'll be there 20 minutes later still spraying with foam just pouring out of that thing. Days. It's shocking. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. forever. Yeah. Okay. Edward Cooper says, do you have a feeding chart for autoflowers yet? Yep. 
Love the show and have learned a lot from Scott and your other guests. Thanks. So people have been asking about this. What's the deal? How are we going to get them a chart? Uh, they just have to email us. And we need to get it up on the website that we're about to put a new website up on. So once we get that new website up, those new feeding charts will be on there. But I've got it from the okay. woman and they sent those. So we have two or three now that nice. are, are being played with. So I think we we have something that are to look at. Well, we can do a little video with a link to that once it's done. Sure. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, Dave S. Uh, this is the last question, I think. Whoa, no, 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 no. Paul's 248. Paul's. Great info, thanks. Question. This is a good question. Do you subtract, maybe it's not a good question, I think it is. Do you subtract pH of tap water from pH of soil values? So when you're, when you're doing your, uh, your pH and things, does the pH of the water matter within reason? It does, but you also have to keep in mind, I mean, I don't subtract. That's the water you're watering with, with, right? If you're always watering with it, then no. So that's the situation, is if you're always watering that water. Without pH in it or checking you it, you're just watering with it, then that is your slurry. Yeah, you can't math your way out of that. No, <laughs> and you can look at them as references. A lot of people be like, you know, it's still, that's a tough one. I Well, let me ask you this. Does, does it drift with, if you, like, say you're doing tap water or well water or whatever. That what's pH in your gonna, water? Yeah, so it's going to change over time. Oh, so yeah. if you, your water is heavily treated, your water comes out of a bicarbonate well, uh -huh. then that's going to, just like Olympus up in there, it's going to slowly climb over time. But I don't know that when I'm doing my regular feedings because I'm ph it after the fact. And so, you know, yeah, but if you're doing a regular water, and yeah. you should know what that pH is. I just tell people when they ask me this question is, use the water that you use to just water. Yeah. So then we know that that's a saturated topsoil mm -hmm. with your water. What so if you're at seven eight and you're watering with seven eight water, then and you want to know what's wrong with your plant, well, don't subtract that. Yeah. Whatever, don't. <laughs> One point two pH. Yeah. Figure out because, that's the, yeah, yeah, that's the problem. So, do you get? I've had bad luck. It feels like to me, at least, using a meter for that, and I use the the little the tape stuff. For right, nice. Yeah, because the water seemed like it's sketchier for getting the pH numbers. Like they're all over the place to me. Maybe that's just me. I have, I mean, it, yeah, it just boils down to the grower. But to yeah. me, the slurry is whatever I'm using regularly for yeah. water. That's what I'm using to check my slurries, and sure. then I'm double checking with my pen and yeah. just going from there. Because I'm not subtract. trying to figure out the, the water is the soil. <laughs> the, right. You know, it's, 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 yeah, blended. Yeah. That's what you're gonna yeah. get. Okay. There's a lot of people though will pH the because they have 8.0 water. Yeah. And with those people, I usually am like, you do want to pH your water because, and not because 8.0 water. We're not. When you're just watering, you're hydrating. Sure. Your plant's not eating the water. Uh -huh. They're just absorbing it and staying alive, and they're feeding the microbes. They're staying alive. The farm, you know, water. It's just making life. everything happen. It's it's yeah. It's preventing them from drying out and dying. Yeah. So that's what watering's for. The um, the downfall of eight point um, you know or higher water yeah. is that that's a bicarbonate in there, and so even though it's in there at eight point oh. The plant's absorbing the water, not the... It's getting something out, out of the water. The, what's left behind is your calcium carbonate that's slowly building up, so your slurries will start to climb on you because of what's being filtered out of your water. It's like you would see the stuff in your pipes where it was got to build up in the pipes. That buildup is in your plant as well. Yeah, and so same thing is that if you have really high pH or really low pH water, I tell people just have a bucket you know, uh -huh. on the side that you adjust to what you feed. Yeah. So if you're always feeding at 6.4 and you start with 8.0 water, you want to pH that down, leave it in a bucket for like two days, make sure it's stable. Make sure it's done reacting yeah. and then water at 6.4 with your thing because uh -huh. you're going to pH your water to 6.4 when you feed in water. So you'd put some, you'd probably use Hades or something else. And you Hades would... or yeah, any phosphoric acid, drop it, stabilize it and vice versa. The hard part is if you have 5.6 water, uh -huh. You really, I mean, you just put drops of, I mean, get a five gallon bucket and uh -huh. start doing drops until you get a stable 6.4. Don't bring because it up you, in one thing. No, drop, no, drop, you're drop, drop. chemistry, you're going yes. seven, six, seven, six, six, five, two, you know. But if you were going down, you wouldn't use Herc or something like that. You would definitely no, you use your Hades nutrition. down. You don't want anything in there. No, you, you want, want the reaction, you want stabilization, and then you want it to go away. Because when add, when phosphoric acid reacts to something, the reaction is done. It changes Over. the properties, and then there's no phosphoric acid left. Uh, I mean, it's literally just it's reacted into, what, turn, it turned into turn something. into something. Yeah, okay. You know, usually rock phosphate when you're doing calcium and uh. phosphoric acid with calcium will just create rock phosphate. So, 
Okay. You don't want to use a nu nutrient to pH adjust your water for slurry test because you're adding in false PPM numbers that shouldn't be there. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Last question. Davis. Curious question for Scott. Does he have ties to Michigan? In the beginning of the video, he says something about sulfur water and made a comment about the cabin. Also, in an older video, boy, people really watch, don't they? In an older video I was watching yesterday, he talked about Meyer in Grand Rapids. M E I E M E I M E I J E R, right? Yeah, uh huh. Meyer, Meyer Thrifty Acres, which is like our Myers. Uh, okay, and knew a story behind the store. Like I said, just curious. Michigan. Yeah, born and raised. Yep. Mitten Man. I was uh, <laughs> born, well, for you. Uh, I was born here. Grand Rapids? No, that's Detroit. here. Okay, okay. This is Lake Michigan. Okay. This is where I live, Grand uh -huh. Rapids. I was born down here, uh -huh. Ann Arbor. Uh -huh. Detroit's up here. Trevor City is my favorite spot. That's and where the a, cabin there's was. a big, is that a lake or what is that? There's, I mean, because it's like a little, it's almost like Canada up there, a little chunk the, where yeah, Traverse City is. Yeah. Well, the Traverse City's down here. Then there's okay. Petoskey, and then uh -huh. there's Leelanau, and there's Leelanau Island over here, and then there's UP. Then uh -huh. Canada and then Wisconsin. So they say northern Michigan. They don't just mean the north well, part of it. That's is that that's, that's UP. Part? Okay. There's up north and then there's UP. Okay. But up north it goes to the tip. So whenever uh -huh. like if you live down in Detroit or Lansing or Grand Rapids, like where are you going this weekend? Heading up north. That usually means you're going like Petoskey, Charlevoix, Traverse City. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, leaving all. Uh, leaving That'd be like going to the coast or going to Bend here. It was kind of a place to go. It's like the country kind of or something. Uh, true. It's just the lake. You're yeah. the lake. Uh, okay. you know, all the songs about, you know. Uh, the Kid Rock. A lot of the songs about yeah, like, yeah, Michigan. Yeah. And, uh -huh. So now it's, uh, it's a mitten thing. And up there, there's a lot of sulfur in the water. And the Myers, there's, we have, when I first moved out here, there's Meyer, uh -huh. M E Y E R. Uh -huh. They're M E I J E R. This Fred Meyer yeah. is his name. His name was Frederick Meyer. Yeah? No relation. He started in Greenville in Michigan uh -huh. delivering produce to the state. Okay. I'm not even sure where this guy started, but he started four years before that guy started, and I thought he started it all, but not this Meyer. And they're literally the same department stores when you walk in. You think it was the clothing. same thing? Yeah. You truly, like, you would think they're the same. But they're not. My That's kid crazy. was like, why do they spell this one so different? I'm like, they're totally different. Totally, they're totally the same. So you roll with Michigan State or Michigan? Well, I was born in Ann Arbor, <laughs> yeah. so I'm a Wolverine. I went to MSU, so uh, Spartan by drinking power powers, <laughs> but Wolverine by blood. Yeah. But uh, the the wings are your team, though, right? Yeah, when they're yeah when, when they're good. When they're good. <laughs> Detroit, we don't have a team out here, so there's no option. Uh -huh. And the Lions, nobody ever liked ever, but we always uh -huh. had to watch them because they're only you know uh -huh. willing to play every Thanksgiving. Well, that's funny. I hear people think like the Blazers and stuff, and I guess yeah, but it's, it's it. really the Ducks. It's really it's it's, well, it's football. football. Yeah, or, or the Beavers. You know, it's 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 a college well, like it, you know like it's high school in Texas. You know, it's like it's a different yeah. Yeah, but we don't have. I mean, we almost got. NHL out here, but Mario Lemieux bought him back and kept him in Pittsburgh because we were going to get the Portland Penguins. Oh. But he bought them. So yeah, that's well, good for him. Yeah. And then, you know, just so it's what it's worth, we were just got back from Oklahoma uh -huh. for the Canacon. Uh -huh. We had a lot of people that watched the show who I, you know, just to do some shout outs because I was shocked at how many people in Oklahoma came up just to introduce themselves and said, thanks for the show. Don't stop doing the show. Your yeah. show's awesome. Really kind of, you know, very pleasant. But one guy have to, and I know he's watching. Yeah. There's a few guys. This guy made me laugh. And you might not get Formula that. LOL. Yeah, so I ran into this guy. That's his shirt that he does. So okay. there's a competitor in town. They're Formula 707. Oh, so he's, he turned it upside down. down. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's pretty brilliant. That's funny. So these cats, great guys. They're yeah. on still water right here. Uh -huh. Really, uh, I can see that. Yeah, it's really, yeah, so those cats, really fun guys. Their dad owns a shop out there. They have a farm running all nectar. Nothing but high praises, nothing about selling out every single time they get a crop down. They're just, it's gone before they can hit it. Uh -huh. But I need this guy to reach out because, I mean, look at what I did. I gotta find the damn picture of him. The health there is not real good. Oh, I know. That's <laughs> They're like, oops. Look at that. I mean, that's not good. Yeah, that's like front butt and back that's back, back, back rack. <laughs> it's a back rack. <laughs> front butt and back rack. Hold on. Where is this cat? 
I'm just going to, and he'll know because I know he's watching the show right now. And he couldn't make it down, but his team made it down. And this kid. But see, they're at higher function farms. Uh huh. But I mean, can you read anything else? Nothing. Claire. Yeah. Claire Moore. Nine one mm, mm, two five. No, I think five. I can get it. But is that a six or an eight? Because that font says both. Well, you can. You can. I'm just not doing try that. I'm not no, gonna, you're gonna try it. No, no, no it's it's probably, probably, you can go. You said <laughs> maybe your farm. You know this cat. This cat is one of your employees who says nothing but great things about you. So. <laughs> um, reach out and then all these other folks that watch the show wanted more info you know I don't I don't market I don't do any marketing I don't bring business cards or flyers I don't have to do any of that so you were all supposed to email me yeah <laughs> so the beard at organsonly.com hit me up with an email I got all the info for you that they needed um, there's it's interesting down there it really is yeah. it's, uh, it's wild wild west um, I was only impressed by like seven people as far as like what they're producing that I saw. A lot of people down there are not producing well, anything but what they should. It's just When you come late to the game, most of the people don't have a full heart. They have a, 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 a love Although, for money. <laughs> normally I 100% agree. However, in Oklahoma, what yeah. I found was that there are true farmers yeah, uh -huh. who are salt of the earth, really love growing things. And I this think is that, an exciting I think the thing exciting thing, thing is, yeah, they want to be a part of it so bad, and they are willing to do anything it takes. And they're, it's the least amount of ego uh -huh. I've seen in a trade show in my lifetime. Well, that's, you say Wild West, people came out here because they wanted to do their thing, and they wanted some adventure. And, I mean, it is kind of that. It's not oh. a bad thing. It's a good thing. They're, they're going it to the frontier. The downfall, they're wasting a lot of money. Yeah. The doubt, like one gentleman came up to me and he goes, why should I buy your product? Which, don't ever ask me that. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, take rocks, I don't sell the product. However, I could see he was a sincere individual yeah. and he came down to our go because if you question. walk into every single one of your dispensaries right here, right now, tell me what you buy. There's the reason why you buy my products. I literally, we've had, in that day, I, one day alone I had two 60 plus year old women and two well over 70 year old women who have commercial farms there. Small micro tier, 20 to 40 lights, killing it. Uh huh. They will walk into these spaces. This one woman just came in and matter of fact, she's related to the Alpine Stash family in, in Colorado. Oh, okay. So she came up and was like, you know, I just want to say hi. You know, my family turned us on you. I love what they've done. We really wanted to hold the same bar that, that the Alpine yeah, Stash yeah, yeah. did. So they kind of coached this through and he goes, so how'd that go for you? And she goes, well, my first run I brought down, I brought in seven different types. I dropped them off at the store and the guy opened up one jar and he bought everything else sight on scene. Take it. And she's like, <laughs> but you don't want, he's like, no. And matter of fact, every gram you produce, just bring it right here. I'll give you this amount for them and we'll just kind of go from there. Wow. So she brought down a second round, sold it all out completely, almost doubled her yield. The guy's wow. just so blown away. She brought him one, a tangy. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, Clementine was this one that she brought them. That's, uh -huh. you know, if you've ever had it and if you've had it from Elton Stash, Clement, he does a Clementine that literally is like heaven in a stick. It's amazing. Uh -huh. So one of her friends comes in for, to visit her and she goes, oh, I'll just, we'll run down to that dispensary and we'll pick up some Clementine for you to try it. So she walks in and she's like, where's the Clementine? He's like, uh, I didn't show that. <laughs> I'm not like, putting that out. She's like, why not? She's like, well, once I smelled it, I, I, I <laughs> see that whole that whole load for myself. Uh -huh. Now he's trying trying to get her to contract with him to uh -huh. teach him how to grow, and she's using she's using the Spartan in number four. Nice. I mean, that is it. This is like when the wine cellar, you know, at the restaurant, it's not on the list. It's like, yeah, let me get you some. Yeah, it's the special. Let me show you something special. Another avenue yeah. we can take. So. Yeah. So yeah, it just boils down to it's it's it is the wild wild west. We're not the biggest cats on the in the pond or the biggest fish Don't in the pond. Be. Now, well, that's it. Is we're having these nice conversations and we're getting these great clients from you know folks that are yeah. really wanting yeah. to know the intel. Yeah. So that's the fun part. Is if you want to grow quality, keep watching. If you if you want to grow yield, I don't know if that works. I mean, I don't. Did you see that email of the day from the guy? I got two emails back to back. Uh huh. The, I didn't look through it too much, but it was like, well, 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 well the tell first me. I was just saying, you know, I've been running X certain name of nutrient, uh -huh. and I'm used to getting upwards to three pounds of light. Uh -huh. What can I expect from nectar? If you know, and it's like, okay, well, 
I, I don't know. If I buy your 93 octane fuels, <laughs> can I race on a track with a Formula One? Of course not. No. Yeah. So, yeah. very yeah. next email is a cat who's been running our stuff for uh, two whole rounds, and he's like, so I just got pulled down pulling my next one, and he does a 4x10, yeah. but he pulled down 3.4 pounds per light. He goes, is that good or like on average par for nectar? And I'm just going, here's this email that I just got. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. that's an average above. Uh -huh. um, but what's your quality? Like, what's your flavor? What's your this kid had nothing but praises on every bit of it. Uh -huh. And to get three pounds of light in a tent, I'm like, three pounds of light on a mass 100,000 square foot facility with lights stacked on lights stacked on lights with environmental conditioning? Absolutely. You should get that easily. This yeah. going to be a oh, question. Yeah. In a four by ten, you're crushing those numbers. <laughs> yeah, you got me beat. I mean, yeah. yeah, I do well. That's and then he sent a picture, and it looked like somebody knocked over a field of hemp in a grow room because it was <laughs> flowers that were like uh, that and just hanging over each other. I'm like, yeah, uh, you crammed it all in all in one. So wow. it's not about it's it's how it's your genetics again. It's your yeah. environment, and then nutrient, and then your love. Once you get past those four, we'll see what you can do with it. So nice. Oklahoma, good luck, bros. And ladies, because the ladies kill it out there. I, for every commercial girl out there that wants to succeed, get the fucking good woman working for you. And not like doing they got your mom muscles or selling your they damn know, weed. They make it happen. They're Mother Nature. Yeah, your, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're employing Mother Nature to come in there and yeah. care. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. Every every one of these farms that had a woman in there or the uh -huh. woman is running it, uh -huh. those are being, they're just a more successful farm. Yeah. Less ego. Plants do, I mean, they feel our ego in this industry, and boy, we have ego. So, reel in your ego, hire a good woman, watch her grow get better. Or at least let your girlfriend in there and let her sing. Either way, put energy in there that's not it's yours. Good energy in there. That's it. That's the show. We out. All right.